All right, folks, the last heart lecture, and likely the hardest, because we talk about control of, of uh, cardiac output, and that's autonomic nervous system control, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we talked about things called like Starling's Law of the Heart and some other things that affect cardiac output. So let's get some nomenclature down. We've already been using some of these words, but let's just make sure we, we understand. The amount of blood le in the heart before it contracts that means after it's done resting and filling, is called the end diastolic volume. The amount of blood left in the heart after it contracts, so this is before it contracts. This is after rest, right before contraction. And then the amount of blood left in the heart after contraction you're going to say, well, hopefully there's no blood left in the heart after contraction. Well, yeah, that'd be nice, but there's always a little bit. It's called the end systolic volume. And what you do is you can contract, you can calculate a stroke volume. That means how much blood is pumped with one beat. The milliliters of blood per beat equals stroke volume. Stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. And we already did that. We already said there was 130 milliliters of blood in the heart, and we pumped out 80 of it. No, we didn't pump out 80. Yeah, we pumped out 80 of it, but we had 50 left. <laughs> I'm doing this wrong already. My end systolic volume was 50, and that gave us 80. So our stroke volume equaled 80 milliliters and I went one step further in that particular slide and I said okay let's do the ejection fraction and I said that's the the fraction of blood that you pumped out of the total amount there and we said that was 61.5 percent which or 0 0.615 so that was the ejection fraction all right and diastolic and systolic stroke volume ejection fraction hope you got it this uh, this I don't like this picture this is sh uh, uh, an analogy of the heart with a pump like uh, you can see the piston pump here if, if it helps you fine I, I would read these if it helps you I personally don't like this analogy uh, let me see is there any part of the analogy I like well, I don't mind this a little bit. Uh, when the, I'm just looking, when the pump handle is raised, pressure on the cylinder decreases, water is one way valve. Yeah, I don't mind. Well, this passive filling I don't like because they're raising the pump handle. Well, our passive filling happens because there's more pressure in our blood vessels than in our atria and ventricles so yeah the blood's going to rush into these big cavities called atria and ventricles because there's less pressure in the atria and ventricles it has a, it doesn't really it's not pulling up on a, on a handle or i guess relaxing the heart could be like pulling up on the handle if you want to think of it that way so this is just showing you a passive filling and that's during rest and then I have amount of blood in my heart called the end diastolic volume right before I contract. And then I contract and push it all out, but not all of it, not all of it. I have a little bit of uh, blood left in my heart called the end systolic volume. But all of this down here, all of this down here is my stroke volume. And just remember my stroke volume equals my end diastolic volume minus my end systolic volume. All right, so that's just an analogy for you for cardiodynamics. Now, these are the overall factors that affect my heart rate. So first of all, or my heart, my cardiodynamics. First of all, let's just get some formulas here. Cardiac output equals heart rate times blood pressure times um, stroke volume times blood pressure times stroke volume. Heart rate times stroke volume. Let me do some math for you. The heart rate is beats per minute. And I'm multiplying that times milliliters per beat. And when I multiply those through, beats cancel each other out, and I'm left with milliliters per minute. So cardiac output is measured in milliliters per minute. 
How many milliliters in one minute? That's your cardiac output. And by the way, it's, uh, well, I, actually, I'll have you guys do the math. What we're going to look at is milliliters per beat, that's stroke volume, and how many beats, uh, well, we can do it right now. Let's say that your stroke volume is 80. 80 milliliters per beat. It's only 61% efficient, but let's just say that's true. Times 72 beats per minute. 72 beats per minute. I have my handy dandy calculator right there, although it's 7 times 8, 56, 5600, about 5600. So 72 times 80, 5760. That equals 5,760 milliliters per minute. Here's what I want you to remember. That's your entire blood volume. Now, if you're a small, if you're a petite person, that's more than your entire blood volume. Uh, if you are a 200-pound person, that's about your blood volume. If you remember from the blood chapter, we figured out how to calculate your blood volume. So every minute you pump your entire blood volume, Every single minute you do this, that's how efficient we are. So that's cardiac output. It, within this formula, CO equals HR times SV, remember that SV equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume, and likely that'll be on the test. So you're going to have to be able to do a little bit of math on the next test. So what kind of things affect my cardiac output? Well, anything in this formula affects my cardiac output. Heart rate affects my cardiac output. Stroke volume affects my cardiac output. Because stroke volume is, uh, is end diastolic minus end systolic, end diastolic affects my cardiac output. End systolic affects my cardiac output. All of these things affect my cardiac output because they're all part of how I calculate my cardiac output. The higher the end diastolic volume, the greater my cardiac output. Okay? Because if you had 130 minus 50 versus 150 minus 50, you're going to have a higher number. The lower my end systolic volume, the greater my cardiac output. That means the less blood that's left in my heart afterwards, after it beats. The lower that is, the better. I have autonomic ner innervation. Sympathetic nervous system speeds up my heart. Parasympathetic nervous system slows down my heart. And I have some hormones that speed up my heart. Hormones like epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these all affect cardiac output. So these are things that we're going to talk about that affect cardiac output. Increased blood pressure stretches the carotid arteries and aorta causing the baroreceptors to increase their basal rate of action potential generation. Action potentials are conducted by the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves to the cardioregulatory and vasomotor centers in the medulla oblongata. As a result of increased stimulation from the baroreceptors, the cardioregulatory center increases parasympathetic stimulation to the heart, which decreases the heart rate. Also, as a result of the increased stimulation from the baroreceptors, the cardiovascular center decreases sympathetic stimulation to the heart, which decreases heart rate and stroke volume. The vasomotor center decreases sympathetic stimulation to blood vessels, causing vasodilation. The vasodilation, along with the decreased heart rate and decreased stroke volume, bring the elevated blood pressure back toward normal. If the initial problem were a decrease in blood pressure, the activities and effects of the baroreceptors, cardiovascular center, and vasomotor center would be the opposite of what is illustrated. Folks, I would play that two or three times. Uh, I will say the gist of it. All right. The gist of it is this. If your heart, if your blood pressure is too high, baroreceptors detect this and they lower your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is too low, baroreceptors detect this and they raise your blood pressure. Now that's simple, but the devil's in the details. How do I lower blood pressure? And the answer is, my, I inhibit my sympathetic nervous system so I'm not speeding up my heart. 
and I activate my parasympathetic nervous system, so I actively slow down my heart. In addition, I go out to the blood vessels, and I inhibit my sympathetic nervous system, so I don't vasoconstrict. And I activate my parasympathetic nervous system, so I do vasodilate. And all of that lowers blood pressure and, and uh, by lowering heart rate and stroke volume and peripheral resistance and things like that. So I would play this video a couple times. Very important. This is similar, but I'm not, and it's actually the chemoreceptor, uh, the chemoreceptors are in the aortic body and the carotid bodies, and they're similar location to the barrel receptors. Uh, the barrel receptors are in the carotid sinus. They're actually not shown correctly right here. Uh, but that's all right. I mean, they still are they still are co-located or approximately co-located with the chemoreceptors. Now, chemoreceptors are the heart rate's going to respond. But I got to warn you that uh, really, what's going on here is you're controlling your breathing. If you become acidic or too much CO2, you breathe faster. But there is absolutely no sense in breathing faster if you don't send more blood to the lungs. Where does the lungs get the CO2 to breathe out? From the blood. There is no sense of breathing faster if your blood's not going to deliver all that excess CO2 to the lungs. So the chemoreceptor reflex is really a reflex that synchronizes my breathing and my heart rate. Chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies monitor blood oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH. Impulses from these chemoreceptors are conducted to the control centers for heart and blood vessels via the glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves. Chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata monitor blood carbon dioxide and pH. Decreased blood oxygen, increased carbon dioxide, or decreased pH decrease parasympathetic stimulation of the heart, which increases the heart rate. Decreased blood oxygen, increased carbon dioxide, and decreased pH increase sympathetic stimulation of the heart, which increases heart rate and stroke volume. Increased sympathetic stimulation of blood vessels increases vasoconstriction. All right, folks, I would play this video a couple times. And make sure that it makes sense to you, especially when you see this. Decreased oxygen, increased CO2, and decreased pH. Now, remember, decreased pH is acidic. Decreased pH is acidic. So if you're acidic or you're, you're capno, uh, you have high carbon dioxide, it's called capnophilic, by the way. Oh, no, it's actually called hypercapnia. I'm sorry. Capnophilic is a different word. This means CO2, but it's a different word. It's called hypercapnia. I might as well write that for you. High CO2 is hypercapnia. By the way, when I misspoke and said capnophilic, that means CO2 loving. Some organisms like CO2 and they're called capnophilic. So hypercapnia is high CO2 or decreased oxygen. What are you going to do? You're going to breathe faster. Now, there's no sense of breathing faster unless I'm going to pump my heart. My heart's going to pump faster. you got to deliver more blood to the lungs or, or there's no sense in breathing faster. So make sure you play this a couple times over. This is a still picture showing you um, how the nervous loops uh, uh, occur. In bio 252, you memorize all the cranial nerves, and one of them is cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, and one's cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. So I don't really expect you to know these nerves in uh, tremendous detail in AMP1. A couple of you took AMP2 first and know this. But what, all I want you to do is know this. This is the autonomic nervous system. And receptors pick up pressure or chemical information. Chemoreceptors are barrel receptors. They send it to the central nervous system. They send it here through the central nervous system. And we respond and either speed up or slow down our heart. That's what I need you to know. Now, the pacemaker cells have a, rhythm, a, a pace of their membrane is leaky. 
that's what's going on. Their membrane spontaneously depolarizes because it's leaky. And the amount of time it takes that membrane from right here to right here to leak to threshold, or from right here to right here to leak to threshold, that's what dictates how, how many times a minute these pacemaker cells fire. So really when I'm controlling my heart rate, when the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system is going to control my heart rate, it's affecting that time right there. So how can I affect that time? Well, normally I'm going from something like, you know, negative 70, uh, negative 60 millivolts of resting membrane potential. And it takes time to go from negative 60 to threshold. All right, so that's it, that takes time right there. But what if I made this negative 60, negative 90? It would take more time. What if I made this negative 60, negative 50? It would take less time. So really what these neurons will do is they'll come in here and they'll either hyperpolarize or partially depolarize the pacemaker cells. They'll get them closer to threshold or they'll get them further from threshold, which will either uh, make the spontaneous depolarization shorter, less time, or longer, more time. This is an example of hyperpolarizing, going down to negative whatever, negative 70, 80, or whatever's going on there. So the parasympathetic nervous system hyperpolarizes. What did I do? Just skip it? I did. Oh, sorry. My parasympathetic nervous system hyperpolarizes. I go down to, say, negative 70. That's, that's more polarized than negative 60. So it's going to take more time to hit threshold so it slows down my heart the neurotransmitter responsible for that is acetylcholine now my sympathetic nervous system does the opposite it partially depolarizes my membrane so i'm not starting at negative 60 i'm starting at negative 50. all right and because i'm so much closer to the threshold this takes less time and when I repolarize, I don't have to go so deep down to negative 60. I only have to go to negative 50. So I repolarize quicker, too. The norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter for my sympathetic nervous system. My sympathetic nervous system does this. Norepinephrine is the neurotransmitter which does this. And this accelerates my heart by, by getting my resting membrane potential closer to threshold. All right, so that's how these... Ner the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system do this. They change my membrane potential. There's a collage showing you all of them. And it's saying, you know, when you're at rest, you do 75 beats per minute. You know, I told you 72, but we're just, we're talking ranges here. And then when, you're, when your parasympathetic slows you down, you might go down to 40 beats per minute. When your sympathetic nervous system speeds you up, you might go up to 120 beats per minute. So that's what's going on here. All right, the Bainbridge reflex. This is a pretty cool reflex. What happens is as your heart passively fills with blood uh, during atrial and ventricular diastole, your atria starts stretching because it has blood in it. And at a certain point, that atrial stretch sends a signal uh, through the through the brainstem, the central nervous system, to increase sympathetic activity to speed up my heart rate. And it's really a protective mechanism so my atria don't stretch too much. So when I have a big venous return like very uh, well-conditioned athletes do, they're going to trigger their Bainbridge reflex. And yeah, their resting heart rate might be 50 beats per minute, but uh, that's probably the Bainbridge reflex keeping it at 50 beats per minute. Really, without that reflex, they might be at 40 beats per minute. Now, think about this. If cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume, and stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume, well-trained athletes have a very high end diastolic volume, well-conditioned athletes. And it's because that during atrial and ventricular diastole rest, their skeletal muscles are toned and pushing blood back to the heart. Their leg muscles are toned, and that helps venous blood return to the heart. And you're going to learn this in the next chapter, by the way. And 
and they're, just their muscles are very toned and venous re, venous blood venous return to the heart is high well if i have a high edv i have a high sv if i have a high sv i have a high cardiac output now remember i, I mean there's really no sense in pumping more than 5720 milliliters per blood a minute i mean it's your entire blood volume per minute so what if I have a high stroke volume and my cardiac output doesn't need to be any higher, well, I can allow my heart rate to go lower. In, in fact, some people, because they are conditioned athletes, walk around with normal bradycardia. Bradycardia is a word that means slow heart rate versus tachycardia, which means fast heart rate. Well, what do I mean by normal bradycardia? Doesn't bradycardia by its definition mean abnormally low and the answer is yes usually usually when the doctor says you're uh, you have bradycardia that's an abnormal low heart rate but some athletes normally have bradycardia and they are allowed to normally have bradycardia when i say allowed it's not like their mother is giving them permission it's physiologically allowed is because their stroke volume is so high that their heart doesn't have to beat 72 times a minute to, get, to pump the same amount of blood it could beat 40 times a minute or 50 times a minute to pump the same amount of blood but it can't go too low because the higher the stroke volume i'm sorry the higher the end diastolic volume goes the more likely you are to trigger the bainbridge reflex so there will be a heart rate below which you don't go because of this bainbridge reflex and that's the frank starling principle of the heart as end diastolic volume increases, stroke volume increases. And that should make sense to you now. All right. These are three factors that affect end systolic volume. All right. First of all, uh, preload is how much blood is in the ventricles at rest. You're preloading the ventricles before they contract. That's all it means. And if your ventricles have a great deal of stretchability, elasticity, then uh, you, you can have a higher preload. Now, contractility is how powerful can the ventricles contract? How much force can they produce? They must be able to produce enough force to open the semilunar valves. You have to do that just to stay alive. But are they even above and beyond that? Can they produce force to make their ejection fraction 80%, 90%, 95%? What is the contractility? That affects their end systolic volume. And then afterload is, a high afterload is bad. So high preload is good. High preload is good. High contractility is good. Afterload is the tension that must be produced to open the semilunar valves. And if you, have, if you must produce, if the afterload is great, and you must produce greater and greater tension to open those semilunar valves. You could get cardiomyopathies because of that. So a high, a low afterload, uh, well, it can't be too low either. Let's just say this. High is not necessarily good. Low is not necessarily good either. Uh, a just right afterload is good. All right. So it can't be too high. It can't be too low. And this shows you that. Look at this. High venous return leads to high end diastolic volume, leads to higher preload, which leads to, uh, uh, well, we already said high end, end diastolic volume. High end diastolic volume leads to high stroke volume, and that's a good thing. I think, are all the reds good? It looks like all the reds are good, right? No, 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 not necessarily. Hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't look like all the reds are good, so... So you can just follow this down. If you have low venous return, then you have low end diastolic volume, then you have low preload. And, of course, that's low end diastolic volume, which we just said. And that gives you low stroke volume. And that's not necessarily good. So you can see these. Then you come over here and look at contractility. If you have high contractility, then you pump out most of your blood. Your ejection fraction is like 80 or 90%. You have low end systolic volume. That means you pumped out most of your blood. That's good. That means your ejection fraction is high. The other way is if your ventricles aren't that contractile, then you have a high end systolic volume that's a low ejection fraction, and that's not necessarily good. And then we have um, afterload, and afterload has everything to do with uh, the blood vessel, 
the aortic tension, vasoconstriction or vasodilation or what we say peripheral resistance. You know, how hard is it to move blood through my blood vessels? Is the resistance out there high or low? And this has to this affects afterload, how easy it is to get the blood into the aorta. If you have a, a high afterload, that leads to a high end systolic volume. That's a low ejection fraction. It's so hard to get that blood into the aorta that a lot of the blood stays in the heart, and that's not good. So, and you can see that vasoconstriction and vasodilation affect that afterload. All right, so that's some cardiodynamics for you, and you can look down through here, and especially right here, you can say, well, what what changes my contractility? Parasympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, hormones like epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, thyroxin. So see, a lot of things are affecting my heart and affecting the cardiodynamics we've been talking about. All right, the cardiac reserve is the difference between what you normally pump out at rest and what you are absolutely capable of pumping out when you're running from a saber-toothed tiger. All right, so most of us never hit that maximal cardiac output, and actually doctors don't want us to hit that. It's get, it gets... You're quite, you're in a quite dangerous area when you start to hit this maximum. And I don't mean playing a soccer game and sprinting 100 meters. That's not what I mean. I mean at the absolute peak of what your heart can do. So we have this cardiac reserve. And some people have greater cardiac reserves than others. And part of athletic conditioning, part of that is increasing your cardiac reserve. I could tell you right now that if you brought my heart rate up to 180 beats per minute, I would probably be in danger, a little bit of danger there. But I can remember a day when I used to watch my heart rate running on a treadmill or whatever. I'd be up at 220 beats per minute back when I was a younger man, and there was no problem with that. But right now, I would be nervous if you took my heart rate to 100 beats per minute, 180 beats per minute. Or, or maybe I won't. I haven't done it in a long time. But I would think that it would be a little bit dangerous for me. So... Uh, Cardiac reserve, part of athletic conditioning. This is the same picture we already talked about. We've already talked about this, so I'm not going to go back down through it and speak to it again. Make sure you can work your way down through these different scenarios, like saying, do I have high venous return or low venous return? If I have high venous return, then I have high preload. That's a high end diastolic, et cetera, et cetera. Just make sure you work your way down through this. This is just a collage of your cardiac reserve and things affecting your cardiac output. All right, this summarizes it for you. All right, it says hormones, autonomic nervous system, and the Frank Starling law uh, and some, some other receptors can affect your heart rate. And it says that you know, when your heart rate's affected, then so is your cardiac output and your stroke volume. All right, here you go, folks. Next chapter, blood vessels.